Okay, so uh, First Peter chapter five, and we're going to be looking at the remaining remaining part of this section of an exhortation. It's an exhortation uh, to spiritual leadership to the spiritual elders uh, in the church. So I'm going to read the text again, and then we will uh, recover just a little bit of what we looked at before and finish out the text. The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. We looked at this uh, last week, and I just want to recover a couple things. We talked about these, that this is, we have three different titles, same office. It's talking about the pastor. It's talking about uh, the one that is to be a shepherd pastor, coming from that idea of being a shepherd of sheep. And uh, the focus here we're going to see in the text is found in that word feed. We also have the idea of being an elder or somebody who has a position of spiritual leadership. Often somebody who's more mature in the spiritual context, definitely somebody who's more mature spiritually, not necessarily by age, not necessarily the oldest of those in the congregation, but mature spiritually. And these people are going to have oversight. This is going to be their function and they're an oversight of the assembly. And we're going to discuss some of that. We looked at, at the fact that within the New Testament, primarily what we find there is really different from what we have in our circles, except in larger churches. But it seems evident that really in every single church, it was the design, uh, the apostolic design and setting forth uh, a plurality of those who would be in this position. Now, we have a plurality here. Uh, we have myself, we have Pastor Omer. Um, but I mentioned before, the church that we were in, uh, and this happens in many churches, what tends to happen is the deacons take on a role of a spiritual, of having spiritual oversight in the body. That happened at our church. We were actually assigned a certain number of people, though we were just deacons. We only had one single person named the pastor, but we had deacons. And really, they took on, the deacons took on the role of what we find in Scripture uh, of being those who have spiritual oversight of the flock. And uh, that's often what, what happens in our circles and uh, independent Baptist or Biblicist circle. Uh, though there are many uh, churches as well within our circles that do have a plurality of spiritual leadership called elders. You have the primary leading elder or uh, teaching elder, and then you have the others as well, which are usually and often lay elders. Uh, they are not in full-time ministry in the sense as the teaching elder or leading elder, and uh, that's that's actually has some benefit to it. We talked about possibly why uh, during the time of the New Testament that would have been beneficial. Definitely, we can see it today. If you've been in a church situation where uh, a pastor has been disqualified or has has fallen, some some spiritual leader has fallen, to have the bolstering of other spiritual leadership available is incredibly protective for the body, as well provi provides this element of. Uh, of accountability one to another. And I mentioned last time, pastors are accountable to the body, just like the body is accountable to anybody else in it. We're, we're part of the body. And there's mutual accountability here. Uh, but certainly when you have uh, a group of elders, there is this, this maybe a little bit less of a bridge to cross in holding one another accountable. And even in this text, you have an example of that because he's saying, Peter is saying, he's an elder and he's addressing the elders about issues. Then we talked about the weight of the exhortation being experiential, but authoritative and confident in the glory that would be revealed. And then we, we looked at the exhortation itself, and that's really where we have our notes. If you go to your notes, the back side, I'm just going to give you those real quick again. The exhortation was to feed, and under the idea of feeding... Uh, you have the food and you have the feeding itself. And we talked a, we talked quite a bit about some of that and uh, the food that we want when we come together is the word of God, okay? 
And, and I, I know what it is. This is a Wednesday night. It's cold outside to come in here. It's you sit down after a hard day's work. And I know what it is to come in in my uniform still from working at the car dealership to drive to church, come sit in and be underneath the preaching of and teaching of the word of God. And it can be a struggle. But what I wanted, and I think what what if I know you, what you want, you don't want a whole bunch of fanciful stories, a little bit of the tickling of the ear. Uh, you want the word. And it takes a discipline of character. Just today, I um, heard from somebody, and they're talking about their Bible conference and how in their Bible conference, they're wanting some other men to come into their church that will give them just a solid exposition of the scripture to really build them up in the strength of that. And so the food is the word and the feeding is not just here's one passage, here's another, here's another, and let's sprinkle in, you know, three stories in a poem. It has to be the explanation of the text. Feeding, feeding is, is really taking that, that content of the word of God and giving understanding to it. We talked about this some, we see this back in Nehemiah 8.8. 8. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. And so the ones teaching caused them to understand. That's what we're talking about when we read in this text, feed the flock of God, which is among you. That is the responsibility being given to the spiritual leadership. And so uh, this is a this really is a critical part. And obviously, it's it's the part of the body, the sheep, to take it and to feed upon it <laughs> and, and to really consume it. And then the second point here uh, is the matter of oversight or protection. We, we find this in Hebrews 13, 17. It says, obey them that have the rule over you. I'm not really looking at that. It's talking about those who are elders. Submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. They exercise constant vigilance over you. Now, this is, this is kind of coupling this idea with the matter of a shepherd. Let's just, let me just ask you a question. With a shepherd that's, that they're, that's watching their sheep, um, what are they looking to protect their sheep from? Wolves. No, I mean, an uh, actual physical shepherd and physical sh sheep. Oh, we harmed by the other animals. Okay, predators. predators. Okay, predators, thieves. What else? What else does a shepherd do that, that in their oversight, they want to beware of thieves, they want to beware of predators? What weather. Storm. Okay, yeah, yeah, bad weather that can harm them. What else might harm them? Disease. Disease, so illness. Very yeah. good. Illness and in, the weather. Yeah, injury. Yeah. You know, you, you have that famous picture of the the one shepherd, the shepherd that goes after that one sheep, and the, the, the sheep is down off the edge of the cliff and trying to get that one. Moving the sheep from one pasture to another. Yeah, yeah. So that's part of the feeding part of it. Uh, but it, yeah, so so you have this part of the role. Now, you can carry that right into the context of what we're talking about here. So for predators, listen to this out of Acts 20. Take heed, Paul addressing the church uh, in Ephesus. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and, and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, okay, that after my departing shall grievous wolves, so he continues this imagery, enter in among you, not sparing the flock. He's continuing that imagery. And also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Another great reason to have a multiplicity of spiritual leadership is this because even from within the flock, within the body, there are going to be those that are going to come up and start speaking things that are twisted. And today, this can happen very easily, especially with everything. I mean, I, I don't mean just to be counting on it. I, I use YouTube all the time. But YouTube has some tremendously dangerous content for the spiritual well-being of somebody. 
except I'm not talking about, you know, I'm not talking about something that's, you know, uh, some content where, you know, you have some sort of immorality with it or some sort of, uh, I'm talking about somebody coming uh, as a sheep, but is a wolf, giving spiritual content yeah. to the mind and hearts of men and women and children and affecting them with that doctrine and drawing them away from Jesus Christ. That's what I'm talking about. That has just exploded in YouTube. Exploded. In fact, it's almost like the stranger the content, the more sure of ha having followers and influence. Just this week, I was explaining this to somebody. Just this week, we posted a, a it's called a, uh, a vertical video. It's a short or a reel. We posted it on, our, on three different social media platforms. And it was from a sermon that was preached a couple of weeks ago, which was on the word of God, but the section that was extracted out was about how Satan is that, like the bird that comes and snatches the seed away on that hard soil. And so, and I've seen this before. I, I put the title in the title, Satan steals away the word. Okay, now, I, if I put on that title something like, you know, um, the hard hearted are not profited by the word, I would just get just a few, you know much lower views. But what do you think happened when I had the word Satan in there? He does I mean, boom. I mean, like, yeah. it's like over twice the amount right away of what we normally have. And I'm thankful for that. I'm, I'm, it, was, it was great to have that in the title. It doesn't say it. It says the truth. And it, 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 was, it was good towards the dissemination of truth. <clears throat> but that content source is just one which has attracted the wolves and people are coming to them by in great numbers to just be fascinated by it. They might even say to themselves, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't really agree with this. I know I'm not, I just want to listen to it. Danger, danger. Yeah. I remember we had a, uh, in fact, I remember Dr. Boyd or Mr. Boyd at uh, Bob Jones University. He, uh, he taught one of my classes uh, that took maybe maybe two, I think just one of them, but but uh, he was a pastor down there as well, and he taught at Bob Jones University. Did he teach when you were there? He did. I listened to him the other day. Oh, did you really? Did, I don't know if you remember what he said he would do when he because he would have to go into theological journals or books written by people who would be attacking the Word of God. This was prior to YouTube. Okay. And if I remember correctly, this is not verbatim, but the quantity of time he would spend in the untruth, he would spend equal time in the truth to purify his heart. This is a man who, I mean, that man knew the word of God. And, and he was staunch. And he was a man of conviction. You, if anybody would think that guy's never going to be shaken from his conviction. But you know, one of the things that kept him there is how he dealt with that. And so it's just to say the elders have a responsibility in this. It doesn't mean that we should just be flippant in the body. We need to be aware of it. Part of being aware of it is this very word of exhortation I'm giving. I'm taking this opportunity to exhort us as a body to beware. Beware. It is, uh, it is exceptionally dangerous. And so uh, then we have this. We have the warnings, and we want to close with this. And um, or actually, there's two points, but this is the main the, the main next one. Really, you you have three sets of warnings here. You have a negative, and then you have a positive contrasting to it. Just just notice this, okay? The first one is this: not by constraint. In other words, how are they to exercise their functions as spiritual leadership? Not by constraint. That's the negative but willingly. Next, not for filthy lucre, not for money, but of a ready mind. Thirdly, not as being lords over God's heritage, not as being a lord, an authoritarian, dominating authoritarian over God's heritage, 
but being in samples or examples, models to the flock. So under this, very simply three points. I, I don't know exactly how you're going to put this, but the way I put it was this. The first one is heart inclination. Heart inclination, not by constraint, but willingly. The idea of constraint is under some sort of compulsion. Uh, when we think of that, we think of something outside that's constraining the individual, but it could be in their own hearts a matter of fear or a matter of seeking to please men. Uh, that can really constrain them to do this. Uh, in other words, they they aren't giving, uh, there isn't this heart inclination being given to the office and to the functioning. There is this weight from outside or inside pressing them towards it. Uh, the not by constraint would, would, would apply a strong area of a self-centeredness driving them, whether... You know, you've heard about, you know, you don't want to be a, a, a preacher that's called by the mom or, you know, as a pastor, I don't want to, to, you know, push somebody into the ministry, a young man into the ministry, or even we're, we're very burdened uh, for missions. And Christine and I don't want to push anybody into missions that isn't, that God hasn't called into that, right? It shouldn't be from this outward force from an inward force of the fear of man or seeking to please man, there shouldn't be that self-centeredness to it. It should be this heart inclination given to it, reaching out towards it to, to give to it. Now, the text doesn't say by whom or by what is the, comp uh, the compulsion, so we give ourselves just a little bit of liberty there. But willingly is of one, one's own accord, the will is given to joyfully, contentedly to the office. The second one is this heart inclination is one of the warnings. The second warning is a matter of motivation, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. This is something that is not just recent, but is this a problem in recent years? The matter of people being involved in ministry for money. Is that an issue? Mm -hmm. Can you think of can you think of anybody? Now we're we're from Houston, so we've got some yeah. we've got some big names down there. We got the big name down yeah. there. Give me Swagger. Well, that, down in Houston, it's what it's brother Olsen, <laughs> brother Joel. <laughs> <laughs> and we we can laugh. I I'll tell you this. Okay, that guy, that guy, he speaks, and. And he, he he entwines himself with warmth and soft words and encouraging statements around the hearts of people. Okay, it's great to be warm and encouraging. That's tremendous. I, I wish I was more warm and encouraging. Uh, we have we had a funeral here, and the funeral director. I just noticed how gracious he was. I told him, I said, Man, I need to learn from you. Wow, it's just so gracious with people. And uh, and and Brother Joel Osteen. I, I say Brother Joel. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> I didn't think about that. I didn't think about that. I said Brother Joel. So let's say Mr. Osteen. Okay, and Mrs. One time I was preaching down there in a church, just talking about how much this can get wrapped around people's hearts. It's a church, small church, uh, Bible-believing, independent Baptist church down there. In fact, I'm very connected with that pastor still. I talked to him this week already. Um, and I was there, and I was speaking about false prophets. It was just part of the application. So I was looking online for some different people who presented themselves as the, the presenters, the teachers of, of God's word. And I came up to this time where Joel Osteen contradicted uh, the gospel or contradicted the matter of eternal condemnation. I forget which one it was. I, I gave this, I gave the quote. I didn't reveal who it was yet. It was in the context of this danger. I read the quote and I said, and do you know who that was? And when I said that it was Joel Osteen, there literally was a <gasps> from the small congregation. You could hear it. 
I was looking up. I don't know who was startled by it or troubled by it. I don't know. Okay. Uh, but you see, they they pass by that because of that warmth there. But the money is unbelievable. Let's get back to that. Uh, you can actually look up online, do a Google search, the most wealthy pastors in the nation. And I mean, you're talking Learjets, you're talking big money. Do you know the name Benny Hinn? Yeah. Do you know that name? Okay. Uh, Benny Hinn uh, has a nephew. His name is, I think it's Costi. Costi Hinn, C-O-S-T-I. I want to read something to you from his nephew who used to travel with him. Listen to this. This was written in Christianity Today by Costi Hinn. He writes this. Almost 15 years ago on a shoreline outside of Athens, Greece, I stood confident in my relationship with the Lord and my ministry trajectory. I was traveling the world on a private Gulfstream jet, doing gospel ministry and enjoying every luxury money could buy. After a comfortable flight and my favorite meal, lasagna, made by our personal chef, we prepared for a ministry trip by resting at the Grand Resort Lagonisi. Boasting my very own ocean view villa, complete with a private pool and over 2,000 square feet of living space. This was his own place that he had at this, his own villa, 2,000 square feet. I mean, there's probably some of you, maybe you have a 2,000 square foot home. 2,000 square feet villa with a private pool looking over the ocean. I perched on the rocks above the water's edge and rejoiced in the life I was living. After all, I was serving Jesus Christ and living the abundant life he promised. Little did I know that this coastline was part of the Aegean Sea, the same body of water the Apostle Paul sailed while spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. There was just one problem. We weren't preaching the same gospel as Paul. You see, he's actually, he, he is, was woken up to what they were doing. He's categorically rejected it and embraced true gospel, not only true salvation in Christ, but true gospel ministry, not for money, you see. So a ready mind has, has the idea, it's very similar to the others, without any delay, in the context, I, I, let in the context, if, if it's in the context of not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, what should you think that of a ready mind or without any delay, what do you think that would mean in that context? Let me just tie this together, if I could. I would assume, or I would propose, that one application would be this that there would be no consideration of the fi financial remuneration when called upon to minister the gospel. Okay? Does, it, does that seem to make sense? There, in other words, there would be no consideration in the preacher's mind of the financial gain when given opportunity to preach the gospel. Opportunity comes, I'm there. If I'm capable, if, my, if it's a possibility, I would, I would love to preach the gospel. We don't need to discuss anything about the finances. You know, that doesn't work too well in corporate America. And there are pulpits that are refused because the salary package isn't right. Right? And unfortunately, uh, you know, it, it, I like to say fortunately and unfortunately, unfortunately, there are many churches that are not in position even to pay full-time pastoral staff. And just like this, I just mentioned a moment ago, the same church, that pastor, for decades, I believe, was also self-employed. Know of another man who came off the mission field. He was over in Benson, Illinois. After a while there, he started working at the post office. Uh, I know others. Different thing. In other words... The, it wasn't a question of the salary package. It was a question of the God's call on them and God's giftedness and that they were being presented with this and they felt God was going to, this is what God had to do. And there was a trust. They were ready to do it without the secondary consideration of the finances. And then uh, third is manner. Heart inclination, motivation, and manner. Manner 
we could we could take a whole session on this. Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples of the plot. Okay, what are we talking about? Lord over God's heritage. God's heritage is, is the church. Lord over, listen to this, to bring under one's power, to subject another to oneself, to subdue another, to master another. This isn't just a light idea. This isn't just of somebody that is has a strong personality. This is really going into their whole philosophy how, of how they view themselves and the body and their role in the body. I spent some time looking for some illustrations of this. So I, 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 I might have even guided what I was searching online. To, to, and this, this is a serious issue. And it's not just within independent Baptist circles. It's in broader evangelical churches. Uh, this is something that has been historical. It goes all the way back to this point. And it seems to have something to do with this, that the man that is positioned as the pastor teacher gets too big of a view of themselves, isolates themselves from any accountability, and looks upon their authority over the body as being a supreme authority and the call of the body is to absolutely bring themselves under. And we just read a text a little while ago about obeying those that have the rule over you. Okay. Uh, that's not contradictory to this prohibition for a pastor to be doing this. This is absolutely contradictory. I looked up the example. I was talking about that just a moment ago. And I mean, it was sickening. I mean, it, and what it led to, what led to in that ministry, the number of people that, that fell into sin. Um, and even we know somebody that was connected with that ministry and also followed that same pattern, not only of that dominating, domineering type thing, but just the other aspects to it is what we know of of that person. There's a lot that goes along with this. I love this. One pastor said this. He says, he said, I have absolutely no authority over you. The only thing that has authority over you is God's word. This is what has authority over you. And some of you know the name of the man who said that. I might not be saying it exactly, so I want to be careful. It was very close to what I said. But that was by John MacArthur. Very large ministry. Very blessed by God. But you know what? By God's grace, he's kept the right perspective of his position in the body. That he does not have this. But what does he see? And what is it that they, that all spiritual leadership needs? And definitely the elders, the pastors, the overseers, mm -hmm. to be an example. Mm -hmm. To be an example of the body. In humility, in godliness, in purity, in the virtues of Christ. To display those things. And then finally, the encouragement, and the encouragement is this, uh, is just simply hope. Hope. You know, we are not don't have time to do this, but this is a wonderful model, if you look at it, of how to come alongside somebody and to encourage them in what God's called them to do. What you see here, this could be applied in multiple places. And if I could take the time to do all of that with us, I would love to do that sometime. But the last part of coming alongside somebody, encouraging them, and what God has them to do is this. You give them what? Hope. You give them hope. Here's the hope. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that doesn't fade away. I mean, that is, that is it. Right? And he's confident because earlier on he said, he himself saw a glimpse and experienced some of that very glory. He knows it's coming. And so it encourages us with that. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your grace. Just pray you bless.